Okay, so today's lesson is going to be on intermolecular forces. Uh, I'm going to kind of whip through this pretty fast, or at least as fast as I reasonably can, uh, because you will be provided printed notes for this. So anyway, here we go. So we're going to look at some very different concepts today, intermolecular forces being the main one here. These are forces that exist between individual molecules of a given compound. So for example, we're looking at the forces that exist between two molecules of sodium chloride. So if you have one molecule of sodium chloride, let's say this is it here, and another molecule of sodium chloride, let's say it's here, we're going to talk about the forces that exist between those two molecules of the same thing. Uh, we'll also talk about the difference between intramolecular forces and intermolecular forces. Uh, but the main focus for today is just on two types of intermolecular forces. Uh, we'll talk about something called the dipole-dipole force and then something else called the London dispersion force. Uh, lastly, of course, we'll talk about what these are used for. It's kind of important knowing why we're even learning this in the first place. Um, but instead of introducing that to you at the beginning, I'm actually going to keep that a mystery for now. Anyway, let's keep going. So uh, just background here, all substances have specific physical and chemical properties which are related to the attractive forces between atoms in chemical bonding and between molecules within compounds. So in other words, there's properties that basically just, you know, come back to the fact that they attract uh, together, right? Now, all chemical changes, in other words, reactions, are accompanied by energy changes. Uh, in terms of chemistry, energy is mostly heat, light, or electrical energy. Those are the three main forms of energy we'll look at. Uh, and the other thing is that energy can be released slowly, like in a battery, where it's slowly releasing electrical energy, uh, or really quickly, like in fireworks. Or in this case, in this picture, that's sodium metal uh, reacting with water. Of course, it's a very quick uh, release of energy in that reaction. Uh, now, two types of energy changes are possible. There's something called an exothermic reaction. You would have learned about these before. This is where energy is released into the surroundings. Uh, so basically, this means the product's bonds, so what's holding it all together, uh, have less energy than the reactant's bonds. Uh, so basically, the energy had to be released somewhere, so it, it gets released uh, into the outside environment. Now, endothermic is where energy is absorbed from the surroundings. So the product's bonds will end up having more energy than the reactant's bonds because it got that energy from the surroundings. In terms of temperature, like that's usually where people think of this, uh, exothermic reactions, generally speaking, will release heat and endothermic reactions will uh, absorb heat. So endothermic is usually thought as being cold and exothermic is usually thought as being warm. Uh, now bond energy, just by the way, is the energy required to break a chemical bond or the energy released when a bond is formed. It's a two-way street. The, the energy that went into making the bond and the energy released when the bond is formed, um, but it's the same amount of energy one way or another. Now, for forces in matter, uh, there are three types of forces uh, just pertaining just to matter in general, at least from a chemistry point of view. There's something called the intranuclear force. These are the uh, bonds within the nucleus between protons and neutrons, and this is very, very strong. For those of you who have taken Physics 30 from me, uh, you'll also know in Physics 30 we call this the weak nuclear force, which is a terrible name uh, because it's actually very, very strong. Uh, we just call it a weak nuclear force because it's not as strong as something called a strong nuclear force, but that's Physics 30. We don't have to worry about that right now. Uh, so then there's another thing called intramolecular forces. So this old one was intranuclear force. That means within the nucleus intramolecular is within a molecule, right? So uh, these are the bonds between atoms within a molecule or between ions within a crystal lattice. These are quite strong. They're not nearly as strong as intranuclear forces, uh, but they're still pretty strong. So again, an intramolecular force is within one molecule. So like, for instance, I'll use sodium chloride as an example. Again, we have sodium and we have chlorine and there's a bond between the two of them. That's an intramolecular force. That's what's holding it together. Now, intermolecular forces, notice there's a little bit different spelling there, intermolecular force are attractions between molecules. So maybe one molecule of NaCl and another molecule of NaCl, right? These are quite weak, um, but they're also electrostatic, which means they involve positive and negative charges. Now, before I move on, I know I didn't throw it in here, but just kind of uh, to clarify this idea of intra versus inter, intra always means within. So maybe you want to write this in your notes. Uh, intra means within, and inter basically means between. Uh, the way I always remember this was I thought of intra as being part of the word intramurals. Intramurals are sports that occur within one school. So if you had intramural sports, that would be something just happening in your one school. 
Um, but then you could have something like inter-school sports, which would be between different schools. Or you could think international. International means between different countries. Anyway, moving on. All right, so intermolecular forces is all we're caring about today. So those other two, the intranuclear and the intramolecular, we don't really need to care about those for today. Um, but intermolecular forces are the name of the game today. There's three different types that we will need to know. The first one's called dipole-dipole forces. Sometimes they're called polar forces. There's another one called London force, usually called London dispersion force. That's kind of what I call it usually. Uh, and then there's a third one called hydrogen bonding. Now, just a disclaimer, we're not going to get to hydrogen bonding today. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, but yeah, these, these are the three intermolecular forces. So these are the forces that are present between different molecules. Uh, so just kind of reiterating that again, an intermolecular force is between two different molecules, whereas intramolecular forces is what's holding the molecule together. So the first one we need to talk about are dipole-dipole forces. This is the simultaneous attraction between oppositely charged ends of polar molecules. Dipole-dipole forces only occur in polar molecules. So you need to have polarity for dipole-dipole forces to even exist in the first place. So simply put, it's just the attraction between dipoles. There's a positive dipole and there's a negative dipole. This is where we used to do those like arrows. And this is like the, the omega. I think it's an omega symbol. I, I can't remember. Sigma, actually. No, it is a sigma. My mistake. It's a sigma symbol. Um, the sigma symbol, of course, just tells you your dipoles, your positive dipole and your negative dipole. So a dipole-dipole force is just the attraction between them. It kind of works like electromagnetism. It's just an attraction. Now, here's the thing, though. Dipole-dipole forces are among the weakest intermolecular forces. So remember, intermolecular forces are never really strong in the first place. Dipole-dipole are the weakest of all of those. Um, but they still control some important properties. For instance, uh, these are responsible for solubility uh, because water is polar. And we've talked about that before. Because water is polar, only other polar things will dissolve in it because they want to jive with this positive and negative end to it. So a little bit more about the dipole-dipole force. Uh, in a liquid, polar molecules can move and rotate to maximize attractions and minimize repulsions. Uh, the net effect is overall greater attraction. So basically, this, this effect works better in a liquid. Uh, but the strength of the dipole-dipole force is dependent on the overall polarity of the molecules. So this is where you use your Vesper shape and you look to see if there's overall polarity. And the stronger the polarity, the stronger the dipole-dipole force. Uh, this we can just skip. I don't really need that too much. But this next one, London dispersion force, uh, is a little bit more important. So London dispersion forces are the next type of uh, intermolecular forces. This is the uh, simultaneous attraction between a momentary dipole in a molecule and the momentary dipoles in surrounding molecules. That word momentary dipole there is kind of a new uh, term. A momentary dipole is an uneven distribution of electrons around a molecule resulting in a temporary charge difference between its ends. Basically in plain English, this is because when you have, uh, when you have uh, an atom and there's electrons buzzing around it, the electrons aren't all moving lock and key. They're kind of all going around there random. Uh, there's going to be certain moments where all the electrons are pooled to one side. In that instantaneous moment, in other words, that momentary dipole, you're going to have a negative end and a positive end as these are all buzzing around. Okay, so basically the idea behind London dispersion force is these electrons are dispersing around and they're going to find themselves all on one side of it at one point, giving it a temporary positive and negative end. Uh, so again, the London dispersion force only lasts for the instant that the electrons are not perfectly distributed. Uh, so this isn't something that's going to be long-standing like the uh, like the dipole-dipole force was. Uh, next up, London dispersion force. A little bit more about this. It was invented or discovered, I should say, by a guy named Fritz London. You don't need to know that, though. He showed that momentary dipoles occurring in adjacent molecules would result in an overall attraction. So even though this is only happening for a split second, uh, it still has a, a notable effect in terms of overall attraction. Now, in terms of the strength of the London dispersion force, this is actually what's really important. The strength of the force, well, that's awful. Hold on, let's see if I can, I can't erase it quite yet. Anyway, no, we won't worry about it. I can't cross it out, no big deal. The strength of the force though is directly related to the number of electrons in the molecule. And it's inversely related to the distance between the molecules. Basically what this means is the more electrons you have in a molecule, the more force there's gonna be coming from that London dispersion force, right? So the more electrons you have, the more powerful this London dispersion force is going to be. Uh, also, the inverse relation is if you increase the distance between your molecules, this will decrease the force. Now, that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone because, again, this is 
based on electromagnetism. If you move magnets far apart from each other, you're going to decrease uh, the force between them as well. So not a huge, not a huge surprise, hopefully. All right, so a little bit more about the London dispersion force. The key point is that the more electrons a molecule has, the more easily momentary dipoles will form, and the greater the effect of the London force will be. So in other words, the more electrons you've got, the more likely that this is going to happen, and the more powerful it's going to happen. Now, London forces are present uh, between all molecules, whether or not any other type of attraction is, pre is present. So in other words, London dispersion forces will happen not only in polar molecules, but they'll also happen in nonpolar molecules. So basically what we're saying here is for very brief seconds, even nonpolar molecules will behave like they're polar. And not just that, they'll actually behave like they're very polar because London dispersion forces are even stronger. And again, the reason that this happens is the electrons are constantly buzzing around your nucleus of your atom. And there are going to be points where there's an uneven distribution. So all the electrons might be pooled to one side for a very brief moment. That creates an instantaneous or momentary dipole. All right, so long story short, what we've been building this entire time, why do we care? Who cares about these forces? Uh, well, here's why. There's one little application that we're going to deal with, at least in the short term. We can use dipole-dipole forces and London dispersion forces to predict the boiling points of certain compounds. Uh, so basically, what we have to look at is the more electrons something has, the stronger the London dispersion forces. And a stronger London dispersion force is going to imply that between these different molecules, the forces are going to be stronger, so they're going to be harder to break apart, so the boiling point is going to be a higher number. The fewer electrons we have, the lower the boiling point, because the London dispersion forces are going to be weaker. Dipole-dipole uh, forces kind of play second fiddle here, but they're still important in kind of breaking uh, a tie. So basically, if you had two different compounds that had the same number of electrons, uh, basically it would come down to the dipole-dipole forces to help predict which one will have the higher boiling point. So again, just to keep an idea of what boiling point really is, it's where you go from a liquid, of course, a liquid to a gas. And what's happening really is just the molecules are getting more and more active and less, less connected, right? So breaking those connections between the molecules, in other words, these intermolecular forces, will help the, the object turn from a liquid into a gas. So of course, having uh, a stronger London dispersion force, it's gonna be harder to do so uh, because uh, the boiling point is gonna have to be higher. So you'll need more temperature to get that to happen. So again, a, a higher boiling point temperature means more energy has to be added to break the attractive forces. Thus, we assume the intermolecular forces are stronger. Okay, so what you need to remember, if all other factors are equal, is the more polar the molecule, the stronger the dipole-dipole force. Again, dipole-dipole, as the name even suggests, with pole in it, only occurs in polar molecules. However, the other one, increase the number of electrons, or in other words, even the size of the whole compound, you're going to increase the strength of the London force. And I also want you to remember that the London dispersion forces are more powerful than dipole-dipole forces. Compounds with many electrons will, generally speaking, have higher boiling points. So we're going to do an example. Um, we're going to use intermolecular force theory to predict which of the following hydrocarbons has the highest boiling point. We've got methane, ethane, propane, and butane. And I even included the formulas in there for you. Uh, there's two questions up here I want you to answer. Are these polar or nonpolar? And then I want you to say which has more electrons. That'll help us kind of predict which one you think might have the highest boiling point. Now, looking at this right now, you might even already know by looking at it. But let's do things the proper way. I would suggest that you pause the video right here and give it a try. So give the video a pause, and I'll go over it in just a second. All right, so I'll go over these real quick. Uh, I'm not going to go crazy on this, but methane, the basic structure of methane, especially in terms of Vesper, would be something along the lines of this, where you got carbon surrounded by four hydrogens. Um, Really, regardless of the way that the arrows are going to point here, you're going to tell right now that this one is not polar. So these are nonpolar. Ethane is C2H6. Basically, it's going to be two Cs stick together, and they're going to have three Hs on each one, making it H6. And again, regardless of what you know about the electronegativity of carbon or hydrogen, this one also isn't going to be polar. Whether it's all pulling out or all pushing in, it's going to be nonpolar. You can continue this trend going on. Honestly, I think you see it. It's going to be three Cs and then eight H's all around it. I'm gonna spare you the trouble. All, all four of these here, they're all gonna be nonpolar. So since they're all nonpolar, we know that dipole-dipole forces are not playing a role here. So the only thing that's gonna affect the boiling point is the number of electrons, which is more powerful in the first place. So really it's almost like we should check in the first place, but hey, that's just what the slide's doing. 
Uh, so which has more electrons? Look at the actual number of electrons for this, not just your, uh, not just your valence electrons. Uh, because we're dealing with all the same elements here, like carbon and hydrogen, carbon and hydrogen, I think it's pretty obvious that butane is going to have the most number of electrons. If you added the total number of electrons for carbon together plus the total number of electrons for hydrogen together, you're going to see that that's a much bigger number. And just in case you've forgotten, the number of electrons um, is just your atomic number, especially when you're just dealing with atoms, right? So it's your atomic number. Um, we're not talking about valence electrons here. We're talking about your like your actual number of electrons, okay? Anyway, just for the facts for the last example, lo and behold, look at these boiling points. Butane has a boiling point at negative 0.5 degrees, so just under zero, whereas methane has a boiling point way down at negative 162. So butane having the most number of electrons has the highest boiling point. So our predictions were, were pretty accurate. All right, here's another example. Uh, use intermolecular force theory to predict which of the following has a highest boiling point. Uh, bromine, which is Br2, or iodine monochloride, ICL. Uh, so again, pause the video here, check which one has more electrons and whether they're polar or nonpolar. Okay, so here's what's kind of interesting about this one. I'll, I'll kind of spare you the details here. If you count the number of electrons on each of these, and I'm embarrassed to admit as I'm going through this video right now, I don't actually have my, uh, my periodic table in front of me, but take my word for this. If you checked how many electrons two bromines together has, coincidentally, it's actually going to match the amount of electrons that are in iodine plus chlorine. So they actually have the same number of electrons. Now, I apologize again. I didn't, this was careless on my part. I should have had a data booklet in front of me. There's lessons learned. Um, but take my word for it. They have the same number of electrons. So what this comes down to is polarity. Are these molecules polar or nonpolar? Well, right now I can tell you bromine, which is just, you know, bromine stuck with another bromine. Um, that definitely is going to be nonpolar because it doesn't matter. Like, there's not going to be an arrow pointing anywhere. They both have the same electronegativity. So we can definitely say that that one is nonpolar. Uh, but iodine monochloride uh, will look like I with Cl on the side of it. I'm pretty sure that chlorine has a higher electronegativity. I could be mistaken, but either way, I do know there is a difference between the two of them. So iCl will actually be a polar molecule. So looking at the fact that our electrons are the same, this tells us that our London dispersion forces are going to be equal. So it really comes down in this question to uh, your dipole-dipole forces. ICL is going to have a higher dipole-dipole force. So it is a good guess to suggest that ICL will actually end up having a higher boiling point. Let's find out. So the facts for the next example, notice once again, there it is, 70 electrons in bromine. 70 electrons in iodine monochloride, and look at the boiling points. Bromine only has a boiling point of 59 degrees Celsius, whereas iodine monochloride has a boiling point of 97 degrees Celsius. So just as we predicted, iodine monochloride ended up having a higher boiling point, and that's entirely due to the fact that its dipole-dipole uh, forces were actually coming into effect. The London dispersion force is the same on both these because they have the same number of electrons, but dipole-dipole ended up pulling it through, and iodine monochloride had a higher boiling point. Whew, okay, one more thing. You can't reliably predict boiling points if one molecule has a stronger dipole-dipole force and the other has a stronger London force. Generally speaking, we say London forces are stronger, but there comes a point where you can have a much, much stronger dipole-dipole force and just a slightly stronger London force. And then it becomes a bit of a, like a tug of war. So it's like, okay, which one actually wins out? If you have this situation, you can't actually re reliably predict which one's gonna have the higher boiling point. You just can't, okay? Uh, another case would be the two molecules differ significantly in shape. If they look totally wildly different, you can't do this. Don't worry about that for now. Uh, but the last point there, the central atom of either molecule has an incomplete octet. So if it's a weird one, you can't predict it either because they're going to behave in different ways as well. So for practice, there's a handout. Um, there's just, uh, I think there's five questions on it, but I only want you to do questions one to four. Uh, give them an honest try. It's all about using uh, the, the intermolecular force theory to predict boiling points and such. Uh, and again, we'll go over this next class when I return. Best of luck.